Let's pray. Gracious Lord God, as we worship, sing, and pray today, as we hear your word, just keep it right in our hearts, Lord, that there's a place in this story for every single one of us. That whatever burden we brought in here today, whatever struggles we have in our lives, whatever joy, however we may be measured by this world, however fast we run, whatever we see, whatever we believe, this story is for us, and there's a place for us in it. Strengthen us in faith as we gather today, in Jesus' name, amen. In my former congregation, there was a, a delightful gentleman and farmer, and his name was Virgil Holt. And Virgil was a regular worship, worshiper. He was a staple at our, our men's weekly uh, Bible study. And he was always the lead usher at our Christmas Eve service, at our late service. And so when my kids were young, I would go back home at, between services, and I would watch them open their gifts, and I would sit down in my chair and fall asleep for a little while. And when I got back, Virgil was always there. The lights were on and church was ready to go. And when you're a pastor, things like that are so sweet. Five years ago this month, Virgil died after a long battle with lymphoma. And now, every year for the last five years, during the month of March, his family gathers to celebrate his life. And this year, when his family gathered, his wife, Dee, had a bunch of letters and a scrapbook laid out of, of things that, from Virgil's life that none of the kids had ever, ever seen. And one of them was a letter that was dated January 9th, 1959. And, uh, and in January of 59, Virgil was in the army, and Dee was in college, and both of them were struggling with the separation. And this is what Virgil Holt wrote to his future wife on that day. The other morning I was marching to the rifle range and thinking how hard it was to walk so fast and wishing that I was out of the army when we came to the top of a hill and I saw a glowing cross. It was dark and only the stars were out and after moving a little farther on I saw that it was really a telephone pole and the lights from the cross, uh, car were coming up behind us were reflecting off of it making it look like a cross. And then he wrote these words. When I saw the cross, my heart jumped a beat, and I began to, to wonder what it meant. There's a wonderful detail in John's resurrection story that I want to hold up to you today. And I imagine that you probably never noticed this before. That on that first uh, Easter morning, when Mary first came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away, and then ran to Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, who then ran themselves off to the tomb, what I want you to notice is there is not one single response among them all three that are the same. No two responses are the same. The one disciple ran faster, and Peter came later, but the disciple whom Jesus loved didn't go in. Peter burst right in with no hesitation while Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Finally, it says, the beloved disciple entered the tomb and he saw and he believed. But there's no reference at all in this story, nothing that says that Peter believed in the risen Jesus or in the resurrection at that moment. Of course, Mary encountered Jesus moments later and did not recognize him until he called her by name. And I find that curious. I think that the story could have been written in a much more simple way. Uh, John, John could have written, and Mary and Peter and the beloved disciple all went to the tomb and they saw the stone rolled away and, and they believed uh, in the resurrection. But it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say that at all, and I think I know why. Because when it comes to faith, when it comes to Easter, no two responses are the same. I don't know what burden you have in your life. I don't know what struggles you have. But I know this, faith is not cookie cutter. And Easter is not one size fits all. Every single one of us has a different experience. Every single one of us has a different burden that we walked in those doors with today. You know what? Some of you may have rock solid faith in the resurrection. And if that's you, then, and, and, and what was accomplished in the empty tomb, if that's you, then that word is for you, right? He went in and he saw and he believed. That, that, that's right where you are today. And I'm so very glad for you if your faith is like that. Uh, my heart is full of joy for you. But others among us are not quite there yet. 
Like Peter, some of us probably came in here today feeling like second place runners. Uh, some of us uh, may not quite be sure about Easter or faith or even God, right? And if that's you, then I want to tell you today you're not alone because in this story, it does not even say that Peter, the one whom Jesus said, you are the rock, on, on this rock I will build my church, not even Peter at that moment, do we know for sure, believed in the resurrection. And some of you are like Mary, setting out alone in the dark, exploring, weeping outside the tomb. No wonder she couldn't recognize Jesus, her eyes so full of tears until he speaks her name and suddenly a faith awakens in her that she probably didn't even know that she had. You see, they're in a stroke of genius. At the end of John's gospel, there is a place for all of us in this story. There's a place for you and there's a place for me and that's the message of Easter. John seems to be saying, I don't care what faith you brought with you today. I don't care how fast you can run. I don't know what response you have, but the story of Christ risen from the dead is for you. And you may be sky high in faith and all in for Jesus. And if you are, then good for you. You're in this story. And God be praised for your gift of faith. And if you've come this far, but you still don't quite know if you can get your heart all the way into Easter, and if there are things in this story that you can't get your head around, like, like resurrection and angels, and, and Jesus transformed but not fully recognizable. And a main follower, Peter himself, who, who shows no faith at all. Guess what? There's a place for you in this story. And if you have wept by the graveside with deep grief and mourning like Mary, then there's a place for you in this story. God's story. If you've had moments where you could not even see through the tears, you've wept so 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 grievously, as real as gr Mary's grief was that day, then, then there's a place for you in this story. And imagine 22-year-old Virgil Holt marching in the pre-dawn dark with his rifle in 1959 and seeing that cross on that mountainside and his heart jumping a beat in his chest and wondering what it meant and saying, I knew it was a sign from God. That's what we have here today. Easter is a sign from God that God is with us and that God is ready to help. Easter is the movement of love and life in the face of hatred and death. Evil claims every single inch of the world, covering it with brokenness and sadness until Jesus bursts from the tomb and says, not so fast. There's one more word to be spoken. And the cross and empty tomb of Easter spoke to young Virgil Holt in 1959, and it speaks life to you and me today. And it speaks hope to you and me today. And hope to Brussels and Paris and every place where there is brokenness. And Easter has to speak to this broken world, and it has to speak to the most broken place in your life and in my life, for those who have faith, for those who wonder, for those who weep and carry a heavy burden of grief, whatever you, what, whatever you face today, whoever you are, Christ comes forth from the grave victorious as saying our, our final enemy is defeated. So when I heard about Virgil's letter from 1959, I called his wife, Dee, on the phone and asked her if I could use this story. And she said, yes, that'd be fine. And she said, Pastor Jeff, you know, for, me, for the last five years, I've had this box of letters. I couldn't look inside. I just couldn't read them. But finally, I was ready, and I opened them up, and now I have them in a scrapbook for the family. See, there's real grief. Five years in the process and hope prevailing. But there's one more line in that almost 60-year-old letter that caught my eye. Virgil wrote on to Dee and he said, then I began to think maybe this was a sign from the Lord, meaning that he was with me and that he would help me if I would only realize that I couldn't get along in this world without his help. And also if I would accept that fact 
and call upon him for help, he would help me and I would be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I began to pray and ask the Lord's help. And this was the last line of that letter. It didn't make the walking any easier, he said. <laughs> but I was able to make the march and last the day. I love that. That's the faith of a man five years gone from this world still preaching. I love that. I wish people still wrote letters that they could pull out and save and reread. But here's the thing. Nothing that I can say to you today on Easter can lighten your burden. I can't make your walking any easier. Nothing that I can offer you today can take away the sting of that loved one you have lost. Nothing that I can say today can take away that grief and sadness that is as real today as it ever was. And nothing in my Easter bag of tricks can change what you carried in here today. I wish I could. I wish I could take it all away, but I can't. The stress uh, uh, that is real in your life, the bills that are due, the marriage that is teetering on the edge, the job you might lose, the rebellious teenager you're raising, Easter doesn't take any of that away. And nothing I say to you today can change what happened in Paris or in Brussels or on 9-11. I can't make your walking any easier, but I do have something that will help you make the march and last out the day. Christ is risen. He was dead, but he is not dead anymore. And Paul says, if the dead are not raised, then we, our, our hope is in vain, and we are of most people, of all people, most to be pitied. But if he lives, then hope lives with him. And if he lives, then our God has the ability to open real graves and give real hope to people and a real future that death cannot beat. And we believe that he lives, and we believe that because he lives, we will live too. And you know what? The older I get, the more ready I am to see that day. The more people I love who I lose, the more people I love who I see hurting, the more I'm ready for that day to come. And that may not make the walking easier, but with faith in the resurrection, we will keep walking. And we will mark, make the march and we will last out the day. So three disciples in this story. Three responses to the same event. He saw and believed. Stands right next to, for as yet they did not understand. Stands right next to, sir, if you have taken him away, please tell me where you have laid him. No matter who you are, no matter what your struggle, there is room in this story for you and you can keep walking and you can last the day with the promised future of God assured in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.